Welcome to Watching Silent Films. My name is Yi Fong, and uh, with me are my co-hosts Bob and Lily. Hello there. Hello. Hey, listeners. What's up? Yeah, it's been for us a couple of weeks, and I know we've been uh, releasing a little bit slowly. It's just summer, so we're kind of coasting on a summer schedule. <laughs> mm-hmm. This week, we're going to review... Um, what we do every week is we pick a silent film or series of shorts, watch it, and review it. That's kind of what we do. Uh, typically every week, but in the summer, we're we're a little relaxed, so it it probably won't be every week this summer. But, you know, we're getting into the fall. This is the last, uh, I guess, week of the summer right i think so next week will be september yeah. am i right let me see what what day is today technically yeah because fall starts right so soon. tuesday next tuesday will be september 1st so that means from there on it'll be i guess entering into the fall season and when that happens we'll probably kind of stick to a more normal schedule yeah pumpkin spice all that good stuff yes yes and so, and then, and if for those of you who don't know, we're we're all recording in our Boston area, and the, so if we have a fall season. Not every everywhere, not like our listeners wherever they are, not uh, um, they don't always have a fall season, as it were, where depending on where you live, you know what I mean. So you can be jealous of us. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some people like it, some people don't. I don't know. Whatever. So anyway, so we're getting into that season. And uh, so anyway, so for this week, uh, we're going to uh, review a uh, one of the last features by Douglas Fairbanks called The Gaucho, 1927. Silent. So before we get there, uh, do you guys uh, any? You guys watch anything? Because it's been a while for us. Watch anything in the silent or classic realm? Doesn't have to be silent. Something in the classic realm. Classics. Um. Um, obviously, my answer is no, of course, because um, I'm busy. My brother, <laughs> my brother and I watched Mr. Blanding Spills His Dream House. Whoa. I don't think Where I've heard that? Of that one. What's that all about? That's um, Cary Grant and Myrna Loy. Ooh. Uh, sorry, it's not Myrna Loy. It's um, Cary Grant and Leslie Caron in a comedy during World War II about a man who wants nothing to do with the war being recruited to spot enemy planes. And uh, he's called, because he's the only one in the area who can do it, to rescue one of their one of their spies. And uh, when he goes to pick him up, it's actually uh, Leslie Caron and like six or seven young girls that she was caring for. And that's where the comedy ensues, because he wanted nothing to do with the war, and now he's got all these young girls on his hands, and he's like... Drives them crazy, so it's, it's wow. a lot of fun. What, what's the title of that again? Father Goose. Oh, I'm sorry. Mister Blanding's Bills His Dream House is another one I saw. That's Cary Grant and Myrna Loy, and that's a movie about a married couple um, with uh, two girls who buys a house. Who's a city guy in a very cramped apartment with his family, and he's really tired of it. So he he buys this house in the country real cheap and it's a really broken down thing and so he plans to fix it up but all the contractors tell him tear it down so he decides to build his own house and of course <laughs> throughout the whole movie the expenses keep going up up yeah. up 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 so he figures they okay, really don't be... make movies like this these days no they he's gonna don't. be broke by the time this project is done and uh so again you can see where the comedy comes in and he's right. dealing with all these different contractors and they ask him questions, and he doesn't know the answer, but he's embarrassed to say he doesn't know the answer. So he says, yeah, take it out. And, of course, it's something essential. <laughs> yeah. But he thinks if they take it out, it'll cost him less because he's worried about the money. So. <laughs> wow. Uh, Wikipedia says, this is a 1948 comedy directed by H.C. Potter. Like you said, Cary Grant, Maraloy, and uh, Melvin Douglas. Yeah, Melvin Douglas is fantastic yeah. in it. Apparently, yeah. it's based on the novel. Apparently, there's a novel, 1946 novel. And it says, illustrated by, it was like, a, apparently it's an illustration version hmm. by an author who did Shrek. <laughs> That's interesting. No kidding. <laughs> Whoa. That's funny. Called uh, uh, William Steig or Steg, and apparently he illustrated Shrek, which apparently was from what 1990, so he's 
he's older when he did that one but interesting very interesting connections <laughs> uh but I... another interesting connection the dp is uh james wang hao which is uh one of the most famous uh dps i mean this guy's who's who of dps uh back in the days uh, from career from 1917 to 1975. Wow. Amazing, cool. amazing career. Uh, hun- probably tens of, not hundreds of films. I don't know. The total what I thought was funny was that I saw in the credits Jason Robards. Mm. And so during the film, I, I kept watching for him. I figured it must be a very young Jason Robards, you know? Right. And uh, after the film, I said, well, oh, where was he, you know? And he was uh, he was their general contractor, but he had like one line in the movie, and it wasn't him. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's just the no. same name. So it was what, like, oh. <laughs> now, what was the plot that you started to describe, but wasn't this movie called? Uh, oh, that was um, Father Goose. That was the one okay, with Leslie Caron. So, all right. So the one we just talked about is the 1948 film called Mr. Blanning's Built His Dream House, but the, yes. the other one's called Father Goose. Father Goose. Uh, so, yeah. so is it's this another the, one I really like. This is the uh, 19, according to Wikipedia, 1964 uh, Technicolor Romantic Comedy set in World War II, starring Cary Grant, Leslie Cars, Caron, yeah, Trevor Leslie Hard. Caron. I don't remember if I've heard of either of these. And then there's uh, apparently Father a song. Goose is funny. Father Goose is funny. And um... there's a song recorded by Frank Sinatra called Pass Me By. Uh, the song is not really strongly featured in the film. In fact, I can't even remember it, so I wouldn't worry about that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they may call it a romantic comedy, but the rom- the romance is so thin that it's really just call it a comedy. Right. <laughs> you've been, you've been, you it sounds like you've been going through Cary Grant's filmography too, huh? A little bit. I like Cary Grant, so yeah. my and my brother does. So I say, okay, let's you know, we we went on Hitchcock binge and. We went on Cary Grant binge. We just touched on. We started to do a um, a James Cagney binge. Ooh. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna delve into that some more. I'm gonna start ordering some more James Cagney. Nice, nice. Yeah, and probably Humphrey Bogart too. Yeah, you can't beat uh, can't beat Bogey. <laughs> yeah. So that's where that's where my that's where my film uh, lineup is going yeah of course you know that uh cagney has had some silent career a little bit i don't know if nope, you knew that i didn't I, I figured it but i wasn't aware of it because i know he yeah. was on i know he started in vaudeville so yeah active from 1919 to 1984 james cagney yeah. so lily well i said no but i was just working on a web series so that's filmmaking but not not quite silent film um yeah it was just about uh like a teenage witch kind of like sabrina the teenage witch but obviously different she does some um, some hocus pocus and stuff happens and it was great and i learned a lot and the people i worked with were really cool <laughs> <laughs> so um local to massachusetts award-winning production company so that's really cool and i'll probably stay in touch with them Cool. Nice. Uh, and hopefully I will watch a silent film this week because I do have a list, except I don't watch movies. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. I mean, if you're busy making them, that's okay, too. Uh, but um, I, you know, I can't remember what I watch now, but... Um, Before the two, I, those two I mentioned, I also watched Yankee Doodle Dandy with him, so... Oh, yeah, that one is... Is that... With Cagney? I can't remember. That's Cagney. That's that's, yeah, that's a, right. That, yeah. I think yeah. he was nominated or won an Academy Award for that, that one. That one's a classic. That, that yeah. one for sure is a classic. I've been using uh, – I don't want to sort of share my link yet because I, I don't think I'm doing in, in, anything interesting on this. But uh, uh, have you guys heard of Letterbox D? I have. I don't know what it is, though. We talked about it when it uh, we had a guest with. on previously who used it, and so we briefly touched upon it. I like to describe Letterboxd as like uh, Goodreads for movies. So I don't know. Again, you have to know what Goodreads is. So mm-hmm. Goodreads is like a website and slash app where it basically keeps track of what you're reading. Mm. For example, you know, you read like you know a biography on such and such person. You just 
you know, enter it into your Goodreads app saying, I read it in such and such a day. Or like, you know, it could be a thing to keep track of what you want to read. That's very common. People do that. So like they'll, uh, for example, uh, in the app, there's actually a barcode scanner. So if you're like at a bookstore, you're like, I want to read this later. So you flip the book back on the barcode. You use the phone and scan the barcode in. And there it is, your your title. And you go, I want to read this later. So you, you, it's almost like just a, a, a book hobbyist, people who like to read, keep track of what they're reading and what they want to read. That's what mm-hmm. Goodreads is. Now, Letterboxd is the movie equivalent of that, if that makes sense. Oh, cool. So yeah, it's like, yeah. okay, you know how like sometimes like, ah, somebody recommended this movie. Well, now you have this app or website, whatever it is, that helps you track, you know, I want to watch these movies and now have a place to aggregate this list, right? Mm. And that's what it is. Also, it also helps you. Some people like wants to keep track of, you know, when they watched it, what they watched and stuff like that. So I've been starting to do that because I have a terrible memory <laughs> in general. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, yeah, I've been using that. And it's, I kind of like it because it, it helps you. Me- oh, yeah, I did watch. So I just pulled it up. And I the last thing interesting I just call out is uh, I watched The Farewell, 19, uh, 2019. I don't know if it's a classic yet. It's only like a year or two old, but I, I thought it was an interesting movie. Um, but that's as close to a any semblance of a movie I watched recently. Oh, you know, I saw something else actually that I don't know if it is a classic, but uh, it's uh, what's his name? Oh, um, I can I gotta look this up now. Um, How to Steal a Million. <laughs> I love that movie. David you like Niven? that movie? Yeah. Uh, what, David what's Niven, the... Audrey Hepburn. Oh, no, who's the uh, who's the male? Uh, say that again. David Niven. No, no, no. It's um, no, it's the guy in Lawrence Arabia. I have a brain fart right now. Peter O'Toole. Oh, really? Peter, Peter O'Toole. O'Toole. That's what. It was. Oh, that's right. It's Peter O'Toole, not David Niven. That's yeah. Right. So it's 1966, and it's that's a Wyler. funny movie, though. That's oh yeah, movie. William Wyler, uh, yeah. another amazing director who's done many, many movies that I like. But I anyways, like everything it's... with Audrey Hepburn. I've t- got a total crush on Audrey Hepburn. She's my favorite yes. female star <laughs> so, of all time. Yeah, times. so, you know, I've never seen this movie before. It's one of those movies that in my library where it's a what I call blind buy. I just mean that I buy it and then I know right. a lot of people tell me it's a good movie and then eventually I'll get around to it. So I just pull it off my shelf and go, hey, let's check this out. Yeah. And sure enough, it's, it's an amazing movie. Uh, basically about a, a a heist. It's kind of a heist slash romantic comedy movie, basically. Mm-hmm. And um, it's about her dad's like art forgery. But anyways, it's it's incredibly funny, and the the, the stars have great chemistry uh, between the two of them. And have you so... seen Charade? I can add the two. Oh yeah, I've yeah. seen Charade. Yeah, uh, okay. A long Charade while is ago. great. Yes, yes. How about you, Lily? Do you know Charade? Um, is Audrey in that one? I feel like I have yes. heard that film. Yes. I, I've definitely heard of it. Um, I've not Audrey seen it. Audrey Hepburn, <laughs> um, Cary Grant. Um, oh, why am I drawing a blank on his name? The guy from the Bad News Bears and Oscar Madison. Uh, is it uh, Walter Matthau? Walter Matthau. James, James oh, okay. Coburn. I think he's James Coburn. Yeah. 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 So funny. Yeah. That one's a classic too. Yeah, it is. Yeah, Letterbox is definitely something I need. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there I are mean, so many movies I've only seen parts of, and, yeah. I, and then I'm like, yeah, I've seen that movie. Yep, it's part of it. <laughs> that's why I kind of started keeping track, so I don't, I don't go a little. I just forget way more than I remember these days. So I try to help me. It helps you get stay organized in terms of uh, movie watching. Because <laughs> mm. you know, I have had situations before, like. Uh, I know I, I like I watched this movie once like a long time ago, and so like, and then I kind of like years later, I start watching this movie, and I, in my mind I said I've never seen this movie, you know, even though mm-hmm. I've seen the movie before. So then I put the movie in, I start watching, I was like, oh, oh yeah, I, I did watch yeah. this movie, you know, I it's like exactly. oh, I, now I you just forget like, the title, I, but yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, in the movie, yeah, and so it happens to me. Uh, not infrequently. <laughs> Maybe I'm just getting more old, Bob. That's probably that, it. That could be it. <laughs> I know where that doesn't like. Uh, yeah. so, <laughs> anyway, let's keep moving here. So, 
Uh, okay, so I, I think that's uh, that that does about it for our uh, what we've been watching this week. Um, to the couch, show. Yes, on to Douglas Fairbanks, uh, uh, nineteen. What is it? Twenty-seven. Mm-hmm. Which is like one of the years where the you know the talkies started and stuff like that, and a lot of people transitioned into the talkies era, and so. Um, I think you have a story about that a little bit, right, Lily? About sort of theater. Oh, and... yes. Go ahead. <laughs> so um, we were mentioning it before the podcast and chatting, but I recently had an interview for potential production assistant work in the, in the state, which is really cool. It would be paid. So me and the director were talking about, you know, L.A., New York, just acting in general. So uh, the director, he's – partially lives in LA and in New England, I don't know, half and half or something. So he mentioned about how, you know, he, he knows a lot of people. So he knows a lot of actors that are in New York who, who aren't Broadway actors. I, I'm not saying they're like famous or well-known, but you know, they were hired professionals working either on Broadway or off Broadway. So, you know, we were just discussing about, you know, it's so hard for them now because everything's just, at such a dead stop because of the coronavirus and you know whether it's well you know it's just theater just seems like it's going to be at a standstill for a long time film work's just starting to crop up but everything has to be you know specially cleaned and organized and you know they have to have covid they're they're having like la people are having covid sponsors to make sure that everyone follows the rules especially if they're union sets so not you know no one gets sued or anything ridiculous. So I know yippee. <laughs> no, wouldn't it be a novel idea if someone made a a movie called COVID nineteen and and everyone the whole cast was wearing masks the whole time? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, but all the expressions in your face, even if <laughs> right, you're right, right. Yeah, yeah, I know you just have to go with your eyes. Well, yeah. have uh. you have you guys seen? Well, I don't know if you guys have. Uh, well, you probably haven't recently anyway but uh there's a thing called um the uh, mandalorian which is like a star wars tv series i've heard of it no, that's on disney it. plus i'm not a star wars nerd so that's okay so will in, not the, watch in, it. The, in the in the uh series it's basically about like that boba fett type character where he, right. he's wearing a mask and so yeah. the main character is just a mask so you can never tell what he's emoting <laughs> Right. Oh, that's right. The, he... That's the entire series. There's like I think it's like eight or ten episodes, and he is like the primary character. He's in every scene, and he has a mask on all the time, like ninety nine point nine nine percent of the yeah, time. Yeah, it's interesting. Oh, that's it. Oh, okay. I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, very interesting. Speaking of unable to emote, but anyway, go on. Mm-hmm. Really. Um. Oh, what was... I? Sorry, I have to collect my thoughts about so, theater. Your theater y- uh, friends. Yes. Those people in New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was talking about, um, you know, he feels bad for all these people who have no jobs. And, you know, if they really want to be able to have a job, they're going to have to learn how to transition into possibly doing film work and maybe break that, you know, the square box mold of, you know, I do what I do. And that's it. It's like, no, now with you know, everything's changed the way it is. You have to learn how to evolve yourself and keep expanding. So when we were talking, I was thinking about back to the pod, you know, our silent film podcast. And when the talkies started, the silent film stars had to learn to transition into the talkies. Otherwise they may or may not have a job. So that was something I was thinking of, but Ifong, you you tell our <laughs> you tell the rest of the story now. <laughs> yeah, and so I I kind of chimed in a bit. Uh, I I can't remember if I said it before. Like we were just referencing earlier, I have a bad memory, <laughs> so uh, you know, apologies if it's a repeat of something I've already previously covered. But uh, that's another one of those misconceptions about silent film stars is that uh, they just you know can't transition to talkies and therefore their career is ended. Uh, that's most likely one of those misconceptions slash lies about silent film stars because you got to think about silent film stars as they do now um they were you know these stars are often from the vaudeville days and and if they're on stage 
in vaudeville, they'll off not always, but frequently they'll be singing and dancing. And so you've got to have a voice on the on the theater stage to sing, right? And to project to the back row and stuff like that. So you've got to have some sort of voice talent or else you can't really carry yourself in those, you know, the, the those theatrical experiences. And I think it's the early days of uh I got to think it's like radio's early days. So you know, whenever that sort of radio started, uh these stars were also dipping into that like the like the current sort of um uh you know like the current like, way that we ju- you just talked about where you got to make money wherever you can find it well the same mm-hmm. stars then were doing the same things i mean they get paid a certain amount for movies in vaudeville but if they want to you know be um you know flexible then they also i think have to be flexible everywhere you know mm-hmm. So I think that, so that, you know, a lot of people have this misconception that like, okay, well, you know, the, 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 uh, the, uh, silent film stars can't transition Well, the reality is they, they can, and it's due to other reasons, uh, you know, why they, a lot of their careers end it. And it's not just because their voice can't carry it. I mean, there may be occasionally one, a handful of people that have squeaky voices, but that's incredibly rare. I'd say the majority of the times these stars have like regular human voices like you and me, you know, and, mm-hmm. you know, and, and if they're able to make it in, anywhere else, they should be able, be able to make it um, to any other mediums. So just trying to dispel some myths about silent films that a lot of people have. Right. Because mm, that's something that's because I don't remember if we have talked about this current subject in the past obviously i've met i have a bad memory too so i don't remember but it is good to bring it up because i that's what i believed because as you mentioned someone you know mystified that lore and then it just seems like oh everyone couldn't make it because we mentioned conrad veit who was in cabinet of caligari he was in casablanca you know in the 40s so that's you know a 20 year that's 20 years after Caligari was created, but it's like he was one of those actors who could make it to the talkies. But then I was thinking of like Charlie Chaplin. Did we, did we say on city lights, the dictator was his last film in it because it was, uh, well, technically city lights is the last talkies, uh, sort of in a sense that, it's the end of the era of his yeah. silent films because even like it, like if you were to hold it up to a, the most stringent, uh, strictest view of what a silent movie is, it has the pre-recorded track. Yeah. So like that's how we're able to see it today. With I mean not because but because you know he had like the uh, pre-composed music and some sound effects and stuff like that. That was uh, audiences back in when the first debut could see it that way. And so sound was already, you know, uh, by the 1930s somethings, I mean, sound was already taken over. The talkies was pretty normalized back then. So that's why it was an anomaly when he debuted his movie in an era where everybody was doing talkies and he was still doing a silent film. So he had a synchronized track. So strictly speaking, the movie before this, I think it was called The Circus, is his last true silent film without a synchronized anything. Because you still have to have live performances of the music for that movie. Whereas uh, City Lights, it has music, but it doesn't have synchronized dialogue, right? So technically, it is his last uh, silent film, like, uh, you know, ever, because in The Dictator, uh, Charlie Chaplin actually speaks at the end of that movie, like vocally, with synchronized voice, right? So he, he gave voice to the Tramp character. Hmm. And so that that's technically a talkie, but so City Lights is his last. But even then, I mean, if you are a quote unquote true fan, I don't know. I'm just making things up. I don't know how how true fan you want to be, but you know, <laughs> you can count the circus as his last one because that was still made in the era uh, of regular silent films, where you you know the choice of music accompaniment was still a kind of up in the air. Whereas starting with City Lights. You, majority of the people ch- probably would play his s- synchronized music score and sound effects track, you know. They wouldn't generally be performing their own. You know what I mean? Hmm. 
So even City Lights is kind of like not truly the last silent film. But anyways, that's as a side. I did while we were talking. I did some research, and the first uh, radio broadcast was 1920s, basically worldwide. So you know, you these silent film star, even though they didn't have voice careers prior to that, you know, right after sometime in the 1920s and beyond, they would have had some careers doing that if they were multi-talented. You know what I mean? Mm. So it is possible to have a multimedia career uh, at that point in time. So anyways, any other thoughts about that topic before we keep moving? Well, just that, you know, I learned something from this it being that it is a misconception. So I don't know. There's always there's always that reason of why I love this podcast because I'm like, hey, we learn something new every time. It's always something right. new. <laughs> always yeah. yes. silent film era. <laughs> yeah. Even though it's a very you know, if you think about it, a very short uh, you know, twenty, thirty year span of movies, movie history has a lot of stuff and you you probably spend your entire life on it and still never get to the bottom of it you know mm-hmm. um so let's uh get right into it uh douglas fairbanks the calcio so this just some context came towards the end of his overall film career but definitely the silent era career because uh he did a couple of them after this so this is 1927 he just did the black pirate um which was a 1926 silent film that's the first one of the first not the first but one of the uh popular ones with a two strip technicolor so it was a color movie but it didn't have all three colors it only had two of the three strip technical colors and um, I think it was Toll Toll of the Sea or something. I forgot what it was. There's a uh, there's another movie with anime Wong. Um, Toll of the Toll of the Sea. You're mentioning? Yeah, Toll of the something. So <laughs> that is the yeah Toll of the Sea. That's what it is called. So 1922. That's the first film with the two strip Technicolor. Uh, but this came after not not too long after that in 1926. So um, he so he made a uh, um, that uh, he made that after his Thief of Baghdad and Don Q, which is like uh, Son of Zorro. I think he did another Zorro sequel before that, The Black Pirate, and then finally he did The Gaucho. So after The Gaucho, he'd go on to make let's see one, two, three, four. Maybe four or five or something like that. And that's probably it after that. So he did another one called The Iron Mask, which is the sequel to his Three Musketeers, um, which is based on, you know, the man in the Iron Mask stuff. Like he, he loves classics, right? So he often loves to tackle those things. Um, and that one was already part talky. Um, when you, when you, watch a lot of the 1927 to 1928 29 1930s a lot of those films very much like the chaplain stuff is sometimes they'll have music but not often synchronized vocals but then you know as time goes on it'll have fully synchronized locals like it'll be like part silent and pod talkies you know so technically if you start getting into the weeds <laughs> the gaucho would be his last silent silent true silent because you know really the Iron Mask in 1929 is part talky in, in certain parts. Um, and then after that, he would do uh, The Taming of the Shrew uh, with uh, Mary Pickford. He plays uh, Pet- Petruchio or something. And uh, then he did another one, Reaching for the Moon, Mr. Robin Crusoe. And then I think the final one is The Private Life of Don Juan. That's probably his final last hurrah. So it's probably his final silent silent, at least true silent that uh, I'm aware of. In, um, so, anyways, what do you guys think overall of this uh Magnum okay. opus. <laughs> I like to play it. Very good. Very watchable. 
very exciting. Uh, very good for Douglas Fairbanks, in my opinion. Yeah, I thought it was kind of. I thought it was really um, deep and in in a lot of ways, and very nice that he did a movie that delved into uh, a religious change of heart, mm. uh, basically based on a miracle and this. Uh, who saw who, who performed uh, miracles I agree I felt like the way it was written was you know you think the story is going to go one direction and then it totally changes when they premiere the gaucho like they bring on Douglas Fairbanks so I, so I really liked how the story was woven as you just said it just um I know in the like the past few like when we watched Douglas Fairbanks in Thief of Baghdad and in Robin Hood, I didn't really care for his, I don't know, like his quirky characterization, but I felt it worked for the gaucho, like his bubbly self kind of fit that character. I don't know. I, I don't even know why I'm comparing the three movies, but it just, it just seemed to fit this oh, film better. You know, it's like, I didn't really care for it in Thief of Baghdad. I'm just kind of like, ugh, this dude. <laughs> like, his big expressions, but Gaucho seemed to fit it better, but mm -hmm. I think it was because uh, the woman playing opposite of him was just so dramatic. It made it yeah. that much more entertaining to watch. Lupe Velez. Yeah, the, so it uh, worked. Mountain Girl. The Mountain Girl. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, she was so entertaining in herself. I mean, um, I thought I didn't. I didn't know how to describe it, but when she was smiling, it, her her face was so lit up. I mean, her expression was just so like, wow, you know. Like, well, it's the screen presence, right? She has yeah. uh, uh, a magnetic personality and very fiery. Very. Now, she is herself a uh, Mexican actress, dancer, singer during so the golden. She had a sad ending. Uh, she committed suicide. Sorry, oh. a bad note for you guys, but <laughs> um, but um, she uh, because she's you know Mexican and I I don't see I don't I don't know enough about this myself, but I don't know if this is one of the originators or maybe it's the trend was started with the whole like stereotypical fiery Latino type characters on screen. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, I can see. Because, you know, if you waving. watch a lot of movies since then, there's a lot of films when they often will recall this fiery Latino, you know, sort of like girl who's often like portrayed as uh, it's sort of like a femme fatale character for the yeah. noir <laughs> genre. But on, on certain sort of genres where they when they depict sort of uh, Hispanic cultures. They off, not often, but sometimes we'll have these type of character uh, where it's like the fiery Latino woman character stereotype, and she's like playing it to that to a hilt on this movie. And I don't know mm -hmm. if it's uh, one of the first, one of the originators, or things that kind of you know how like cliche starts. Well, somebody's got to start somewhere, right? The cliche. Mm -hmm. And so either way, I just felt that it was. Just that whole thing was like, and also it's uh, pre code. You, uh, you guys familiar with Hayes code? What that means? Yes. No. Because, yeah, you explain it, Ifong. You're better at it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, you know, the Hayes code and. Uh, Hayes code. Yeah, the um, Hayes code is nuts. It's What's something. That? Yeah. I mean, it's re relating to hazing. Oh no 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 no! So so I was uh, Hayes Coat in in reference to movies, right? Not related not related to the term hazing. Uh, not, I, I don't, yeah, it's like yes, but no. I the Hayes Code represents what you could and could not do for certain films, like oh, regarding think, the behavior between one character to another. Right. Yeah, based, um, especially based on race. Uh, yes. No, 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 no. It's well, based on mm. um, it, it. It's sort of like you know. Nowadays we have like uh, the NPA ratings, right? Like a movie right. would be rated G, yeah, uh, PG thirteen, right? Uh, R, it, it sex yeah. and violence, right? There's some, 
you know, you can get away with certain things in a PG-13 picture where you can't. Like, for example, I can't remember the movie now. <laughs> but I saw this movie. I really... I, maybe it was Knives Out. So in that movie... I, or maybe it's... I, no, it's not that one. I, I can't remember which movie now. Don't, <laughs> don't quote me on it. But whichever movie it is, it was like a PG-13 movie, right? And I was like, wow, this has a lot more F-words than I remember. And, like, I seem to remember in the past, PG-13 only allowed one F-word mm. or, like, none at all. It, yeah. And so right. your, your standard of uh you know uh what you Stands think is always like, changing usually yeah going down. so that's that's the mpa so mpa is uh the evolution of the Hayes code so in the Hayes code okay. started in the <gasps> 29 30s and by 1934 it started to have have an impact on this and what that means is that uh in the late 20s after the talkies came out a lot of sort of the uh, Christian sort of elements and Catholic elements in uh, America came together and basically was uh, making a call to the government saying uh, all these TV, there's no TV back, but movies, especially there are a lot of issues that they had with um, movies that are pushing the boundaries mm-hmm. of like sex and violence and drugs and on and on and on. There's a whole long, long list and they already started talking about it using law and uh in i think sometime in 27 even before the talkies or somewhere around there and it's a bunch of stuff you know it's very actually very specific like you know how uh people can't take the lord's name in vain so you know prior to the 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 Hayes code people just swear with you know you know jesus christ frankly scarlet huh Frankly, Scarlet. Yeah, or know. whatever. Yeah. You know, whatever, <laughs> whatever the, the 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 thing that they have with that, or like, you know, nudity and uh, yeah. depiction of sex and, and drugs, even slavery. So it's like know. the a- MPAA before there was the MPAA. It, yeah, yeah, and so that's what they call Hayes Code. Yeah, H A Y apostrophe Hayes Code, and so like, you know, and there would be specific things like, you know when you kill somebody it can't be like it's just you know a stab like it's depicted today it's not brutal. okay i'm missing how this is I, I, I kind of lost the connection to the gaucho on this oh so yeah so you know the the movie uh character uh Lube was pushing sort of the sexuality element oh really so oh pushing. at the time uh... well if you think about it there's that scene where she was dancing very suggestively and yeah, you know, she's got loose clothes. It's like it's it's probably for Douglas Fairbanks' picture, which is traditionally very, very much boyish and very adventurous, very tame. I think, right? Mm. This movie that I think uh, this is a movie that one of the recommendations that we had a previous guest on recommended. One of her points was saying that it's a whole lot more darker <laughs> than any of the other movies he's done before, and also that had all these different elements in it way beyond the normal adventurous sort of adolescent boyish type adventure that he's primarily known for, I think even up to this point. Right. And so, uh, like I I remember when I was watching this movie and at some point in the movie, like somewhere in the middle, uh, there's this character, uh, called the victim of black doom is portrayed by Albert McCurry. And, He's a character. There's some sort of. He's almost like a a a, le, a, a, lep, a, a uh, leper. Yeah, yeah, like somebody who's affected with some sort of condition where if he t- touches somebody, they'll get affected by what it's mis- It's not like explicitly known what he has, but he has an illness that affects his looks and stuff like that, which would probably be equivalent given the the religious nature of this movie of the the leper and stuff like. That. So so like. So when um, when there was a scene in the movie when he's like judging, he, he and um, one of the priests that he abducted was judging prisoners that they're bringing out for fun, right? Mm-hmm. So when it came time to judge this person who had this affliction, right? He said, go and kill yourself. Right. Yeah, that was, was pretty like, rough. Whoa! I, was like, that... I know, I did that too. I was like, whoa! I was like, <laughs> this took a dark turn real quick. I was like, oh, we're going to go there. 
I mean, I thought he was going to be joking. As I'm just kidding. But no, he was serious. Like, he stuck to it, right? The yeah. Douglas Fairbank, the Gaucho yeah. character. Yeah. yeah. Like and this, I was like, yeah, whoa. Like, I just told him to do what I would do. Yeah, yeah. I was just floored by the, the darkness of that. And, and, and so, like, there's, like, that element, right? There's also elements like, you know, the dancing part, right? When the, the, the mountain girl first met Gaucho and they had a dance se- sequence there. And uh, I don't know. It's a, it's a whole collection of these scenes um, that was kind of pushing the boundaries. I think that's the whole point we was trying to make with the Hayes Code. That's all. This is pre. That's what. That's when. So when you hear the terms like pre code or post code, it just means like pre Hayes Code, which means somewhere around mid nineteen thirties, nineteen thirty four, thirty five, when they, the the uh, legal stuff started to come out and say you can't do this anymore in movies. So they got away with a lot of stuff before that call the pre-code movies right mm. so this would be pre-code for sure but anyways there are certain things like the way he's chain smoking like crazy somehow it's still yeah, right yeah um, anyways so uh finishing off one cigarette to light another one that was, that was, yeah. that was pretty funny i do have to say though that the detail of the lighting of the cigarette i mean he must have practiced yeah. Like thousands of times on how to do that. Did you guys notice that? Yeah, lighting the match with his thumbnail. Yeah. It, yeah it, or I was whatever wondering you can find. how he did it. It's like a magic trick. Yeah, it's yeah. like a magic trick. Right? It's like sleight of hand. It you really have to is. strike it just right and then. Yep. Poof. And for our listeners, <laughs> just to make sure they know what this is, the, the gaucho just is the cowboy. That's in, in I, I guess, Spanish, right? So that's what that means. He, he's a cowboy, but he's also like. They introduced him originally as a bandit, and he's leading like more than a hundred men, right. like an army. Mm-hmm. He's leading like an army, right? So he's like a major bandit, right? And he says the first line out of his mouth is, "You know, the world is ours for the taking, and there it is. Let's go take this town." You know, right. <laughs> mm-hmm. wow. You know, that took a twist right off, right in his first line that I did not expect at all. And it was very refreshing. Yeah. Oh, I was absolutely. like, oh, he's a he's a bad guy. <laughs> and he was. Yeah, he was it, a bad guy. I think it is his, uh, as far as I know, maybe I'm, I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, listeners. And uh, always send us an email at watchingsilentfilmsplural at gmail.com. Uh, anytime, if we make a mistake, just send us an email to correct us. Uh, we're definitely by no means perfect. So, yeah, as far as I know, this is one of the characters he's ever played where it's at least more morally ambiguous, if not like more on the uh, maybe not outright villainous, but more just like a um, a sort of like a, the antihero. Kind yeah, of. Bef- probably no. before when that term was coined. You yeah, know? I see him as a villain at first. It has a conversion. Exactly. And I think that's fantastic. Because yeah. he starts off, I mean, you see the way he treats his second in command. I mean, he abuses him. Right. He yeah, humiliates he him, him and abuses him. Right. So, I mean, he's not a nice guy. <laughs> no, he's not. Hmm. Anything else that jumped out at you guys when you were watching this? Um, I loved, um, like I said, I, I loved the, the girls. I thought I, every time she was had that crazy smile i was mesmerized by it um but also i loved what they did with the uh cattle the scenes with the cattle were great of course I with mean, the finale too right it plays a especially in the role. finale especially in the finale mm. yeah um, i loved how he just brought that back in i, I did think... and, and i liked how she used his line against him as the closing line Yes, that's the I thing was. I was going to comment on is the screenplay or the the story and the screenplay is so tight. Everything is so woven in like so uh there's no it's not there's no, it's not a waste there's no mo- waste in this movie if I had to, right. like I agree. You know, they trimmed out all the fat. Everything is yeah. like as slim Relevant. as you can get. Mm-hmm. Right. You can't take any part out of this movie cuz right. it'll get lost. Yeah, when we were talking about City Lights and we talked about certain things he did that were, you know, 
they do weren't really part of the storyline. They were there to showcase ta- his talents, but right. uh, in this movie, there isn't much of that. So, but um, oh, Lily, anything else away. stand out for you? I was just trying to think about it. And I I was thinking about just going back to the very beginning of the movie when we were talking about the religious significance of it. And basically, um, oh, the character's name. And so she's the she's not the mountain girl. She's uh, the girl of the shrine. Yeah, right. The girl um, of the shrine. She yeah, she basically, you know, spoiler, miracle. she falls off a cliff and, the you know, she, girl. yeah, the miracle yeah. girl. She, I would say she technically she should have died, but oh, she's saved clearly. by yeah, oh, clearly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but she like sees the Mary and she gets they threw up. Over clearly died <laughs> the, the, the after it hit the yeah. embankment below, yeah, <laughs> which is pretty good. <laughs> oh, too funny, but yeah, yeah um, she sees Mother Mary, or you know, either she brings her back, and then from where she sees her, it you know it turn that's what really starts the film off. And, um, who, by the way, is Mary Pickford? Just saying. So you know. Yeah, wow. I saw that. It, I saw that in one His of the wife. comments from YouTube. Yeah. So I thought that was cute. But it reminded me of the, you know, I'm Catholic, so I was trying to think of the kids who saw Mother Mary in. Oh, I don't know. It was like three. I think it was like Mother Teresa. Actually, she and her two siblings saw Mary somewhere. It was just reminding me of the old like folklore oh my gosh i can't remember but i i don't know i just think there's something because they did add this religious aspect to the story it you know it makes it more mystical and not almost that more believable because this girl has been blessed and then douglas fairbanks is taken by her as the gaucho but not in like we were saying not in a sexualized way just like she's so becoming from her beauty of like being the saint yeah internally and being the saint her innocence is yeah yeah. her purity of soul yeah i guess yeah. yeah that's a good way to put it the purity of her soul that you know she wants to help him with nothing in return that's why you know she works for the church yeah. in the shrine and this it's like the same with the the padre he only wants to help out the poor and the damned whereas you know yeah. everyone else just wants to take it from them yeah so yeah. it's kind of it's i don't know just thinking of like what's happening in today's day and age it is kind of like it's like humbling to see that now yeah. cuz it's like it you almost don't get that unless you go to a shelter you know yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. You know, there's one line that really hit me in the movie. And it's when he um, when he told her, you know, I don't understand you, but I can't stop thinking about you. Mm. You know, because she was so different than anything he, he understood. And I thought it was great in contrast to him being a criminal, you know, to him being a quote unquote villain. Mm-hmm. even though he was in the middle of this conversion at the time, you know, I thought it was really cool for him to open up to her that way and say, you know, I just can't understand you, but I can't stop thinking about you, you know? Mm. And again, it, not in a romantic sense, mm-hmm. not just uh, just him having this co- internal conflict of realizing there, there can be people in the world who really only think of others, not themselves. Yeah, and they don't want to take anything. Right. It's not for self and most selfish motives, yeah. Yeah, and basically everyone... That's kind of everyone's scheme in this... <laughs> scheme? Everyone's kind of <laughs> scheme in this film is they all want something. I which love I mean, that that's... <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but yeah, that is kind of a good plot point where it's, you know, he wants to take over the world. The, you know, his mate, he wants to get revenge. The mountain girl, she wants the gaucho, you know, and then the only one who doesn't really want anything is the girl of the shrine. She just, Mm -hmm. I mean, she wants to help people, but it's not like a want. It's not a selfish motivation. Yeah, it's not a selfish motivation. In that scene, Bob, uh, she responds, or he responds, I believe in you, like italicize you. Oh, right. He believes in 
her and sort of her spirit that's inside right. her, as it were. Yeah. And so she, I think he's attracted by her own faith and belief in whatever healing and stuff. I mean, I don't think he saw that in her character perspective, but there was something about her that he believed in her and that it, it ultimately what led him to his conversion, of course, and his own sightings of the, uh, the uh, Virgin Mary yep. miracle and then him putting his hand in the water and then getting exactly it. and getting a, you know, having a miracle himself. Yeah. Yeah. It's about, you know, I, it, I think it's a bit late for the listeners, but the general plot of this movie, yeah. I should have done that earlier <laughs> is uh, the gaucho, AKA the cowboy slash bandit character, you know, leads a, uh, a army of people, but they kind of rule the land as kind of misfits, I would say, uh, slash bandits in, in in Latin America. Did they specify a country? I can't remember. But South South America. They did say that. Yep. Yeah, is that? But it's not a country. They didn't say the country. No. No, yeah, they so, called it the city of the miracle. Right, right. So these are all you know made up uh, places, but. It's supposed to take place in South America, Latin America region, and and that you can tell by the soldiers' uniforms, right? And among so, other things, among, among and by the architecture of the town, and so they're contextualizing this in in that culture where you know it's these these characters. It's supposed to be like a cowboy character who herds you know cattle, you know cows, stuff like that, and but of course. You know, in this story, he's also like abandoned, apparently. <laughs> and so uh, the story is that he is known as a wanted um, criminal by sort of the authority uh, of the place. And so basically there's a conflict at hand where, you know, authorities want to capture this bandit. And the bandit, of course, will, you know, uh, ultimately come to defeat the the authority because the authority is corrupt, right? So 10,000 pieces. That's it. Yeah. Dead it's kind of high level. The plot <laughs> summary is that, you know, the authority that was governing this, uh, some, you know, South America, uh, Latin America sort of country is corrupt. And so, yeah. Uh, but he himself is corrupt. And so between yeah. all that, there's very sort of little, light except for this uh religious element in here of this uh girl who witnesses uh virgin mary and you know heals the the sick and and stuff like that but also like uh, will will build the shrine and continue to kind of um heal people and give money to the poor and kind of do kind of god's work quote unquote, mm -hmm. and, and help the, the the places there it's almost like between the corrupt government officials and the bandits, there's no safe haven except for sort of the solace of yeah. the shrine that they have. So that's the plot of the, the movie is yeah. that ultimately, uh, you know, the good you know, side wins out, of course, and all of the corrupt government officials and the bandits is all gone by the wayside. The, the good yeah. wins. In. It's a very high level summary. But One of the features I like about the movie a lot is that it – you know, and it, I don't. I don't want to make it sound preachy, but it really gives a, a sort of, in my, in my opinion, it gives it an insight into why the disciples, the twelve apostles of Jesus, were following him. It's like it's kind of an illustration of what they saw in him is what the gaucho could see in this girl, you know, and and decided there was something about him that they wanted to understand better. So they decided they would follow him. Absolutely. And I think that the movie does a good job in relaying that sort of sentiment. Right. Without without being really preachy, you know. <laughs> Preach it, brother. Preach it, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to give the listeners the idea that the movie is, is really preachy, but it does certainly does have a religious element to it. So, you know what I mean? But I also will say that it, it is a common element for uh, many films of the era in the silent film era where mm. it, it, not everyone, but there are still a lot of sort of, you know, Judeo-Christian background Americans in 
when they make movies, and maybe not just Americans, just a lot of, I guess, uh, maybe people of the West, I guess. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But when, you're, when you've are when you got this tradition that's been there for a long time, it seems to kind of come with you. And so when they make these movies, it's inescapable some of these elements will be in there. For example, like Charlie Chaplin, when he did uh, The Kid in uh, 1921, they had, it just cuts to like Christ bearing the cross. Like literally, mm-hmm. you know, the the imagery just is inescapable, you know, mm-hmm. and it's not like an explicit, you know, story like this one, but it's, it's just woven in there. And there are a lot of movies like that, you know, just, just due to the nature of the tradition people have uh, held on to in, in, the, in that time and context. But you're right. It does uh, give you some, those interesting pictures and stuff like that. Um, I, I do have to say that it's this movie of in and I feel like the later silent films, you know, uh, silent movies after 20 mid 20s and late uh, 20s, you know, the years from like 1924, 25, 26, 27 and beyond. They came out with a huge ton of great stuff. And and I feel like it's because these artists are at the peak of their careers, you know? And it's kind of like uh, almost kind of sad that uh, the talkies had to come and ruin it. <laughs> Not that the talkies ruin anything. <laughs> A but true it, silent film fan speaking. <laughs> uh, but you, you kind of get my point of saying that a little bit in the sense that I feel like like Douglas Fairbanks as an artist, to see where he came from, even from – uh robin hood when we watched that and right what was the other one the mark of zorro certainly Mm -hmm. uh i think that was 1920 that was one of the big hits that he got even before all of the previous shorts that he did so you could see his career evolution from that to this and i'll tell you something like his um technical prowess uh, is just matured greatly, you know, from yes. from that mm. that movie to this. Yep. In the I, way I that everything's that technically shot, and, in the and way his, and his acting improved greatly. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. it's a lot I mean, more. He went subtle. from being really cheeky and plastic to having much more depth in this movie. In darkness, yeah, you know, going from darkness to light that just takes a lot of talent to pull off, and and uh. Another thing is just the story element, the way that the the scenarist or the the story, you know, writers or the authors or whoever is putting this together so tightly woven, like I was saying before, that you can't really take anything out of this because it's going to fall apart with it's just it, There's so much setup and payoffs and everything's so intricately woven to one another. And I just love that the story so tightly uh, written, but also that. Uh, when I watched this movie, even for like a silent film, I feel like it was the emotions it depicted on this movie. So like it's it's very high emotion. If I don't know how better else to describe it. Every scene is just like highly emotional of like going one thing to another, whether it's, you know, the mountain girl wanting um, uh, the gaucho or whether it's, you know, <coughs> the. Uh, the uh the the ruiz um sort of the, the corrupt uh government at hand uh taking the money away from um the shrine or the city of miracle just everything is so incredibly heightened everything is the 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 stakes are so high and it's just you know just high emotion all around you know so I don't know. I, I don't know how else to best describe it, except for that. Just every the stakes are much higher in this one for all the different characters, you know, whether it's the main characters or the, the background characters. You just I think you just feel a lot more and it kind of leads itself to when the Gaucho character goes through what he goes through. You, you it all coalesces and adds to the emotion that you feel you kind of with him when he gets uh, infected by sort of the black doom, what, whatever it is, you know, the black doom. Yeah. yeah. Which is like the black plague, but I don't know why they didn't want to say it. <laughs> yeah. I, 
to finish the, another point I was trying to make earlier was that the artists, like when they get to the peak of their career, like whether it's like City Lights or this or Nosferatu, even for F.W. Murner or Sunrise that he did, or all these movies where these great artists, right, they make kind of their capstone career before the talkies came along. And they're so technically proficient, or even like Buster Keaton's The General, which is the late 20s. It's just so amazing that, that those pieces of work uh, not only just exist, but they're made at the height of these artists' career. You know what I'm saying? The silent films of the, the 25, 26, 27s, that's why they're so amazing because they're so polished by then. Because the artists that have been working on them essentially have been working towards making these movies, their magnum opuses, since the, you know either the 19-teens or the 1920s, the early 20s. You know They've been honing their skill, making other movies. They've been honing their craft. And so what I'm trying to say is by the time, like Douglas Fairbanks, by the time he arrives at their final silent, like for him, the, the gaucho, it's like, it, it's like a wild oil machine, you know? He knows what he's doing, and he knows what he wants to do, and he also wants to do it in a way that expresses um, the message that they want to communicate, you know? So that's my point I was trying to make, <laughs> if that makes sense. Does that sort of make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think you put it pretty well. Um, what do you guys think of, like, just... Uh, I don't know who wrote the score on the copy we... But what would you guys think of the music? A comfortment? Well, that depends. I yeah. watched the YouTube version, so I'm not sure I saw the one same one with you. I think it's the same, yeah. No, we okay. watched all the same one. Right. I, you know, to be honest with you, like, I, I thought it could be better. Right. I felt like it was like, the kind of music that in the old Western, like, barroom scene, like, you know, like, it, it's it felt, kind of, yeah, it felt, felt so shallow, like, it, like, it could have been fuller, <laughs> yeah, if they used an orchestra, but it sounded like it was like a four man band or something, you know, <laughs> yeah. so I which felt is pretty like, typical, you know, it's a small yeah, band trying to uh, yeah. accompany silence. Well, that's all in all how I felt. I felt like a, a lot of things were like rinky dink. The music was sort of rinky-dink, and I was like, uh, hmm. I do have to say that they do at least react to the scene properly. That's true. They like, did. Yeah. I did notice that. I did notice that. I said, like, at least compared to, with... remember when we watch uh, Fear, where the music yeah, is was... absolutely bonkers? Yeah, I did not <laughs> watch it. They, they have, like, bandstand music going off, and the guy's like, oh, 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 God, oh. Yeah. And, you know, it's going, da, 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 da. <laughs> no, no, that's not what's happening. Yeah. You know, <laughs> So I, I just that's the only thing I want to comment on is at, le- at the very least it uh, followed the action and reacted to it. It did. It, it was it was with the scene to scene. Yes. Right. It, right. Yeah. It yeah. It wasn't the best. It wasn't the worst. I have to agree with you, Bob. Some parts it's like some parts I thought. I mean, they could have been better. Obviously, they weren't horrible. But then it, the way it would shift, it kind of it wasn't. You know, it just it didn't complement the scene as much. I mean, even if it fit. I think they could have had someone who's more, you know, if someone that knew how to score it properly, they would have obviously done a better job. Right. <laughs> someone just was kind of like, hey, this might work. Hey, it works. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, I would hope that wasn't the original score. At least, you know, not with the four-man band. They would have uh, at least had a ten-man band. <laughs> it, I don't know if there was an original written for this. I, I don't really know. Uh, maybe so. Uh, I didn't think it was. I didn't think it was like absolutely terrible, but I just thought it could have been better. Right. Yeah. Same. Not not the worst. Uh, another like sidetrack. I'm sure Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford have biographies, correct? Do you know if they would talk about stuff like this in those? Uh, they would have what? What was that? Like um, I don't know. Just thinking of. You know, the silent film stars biographies, if they would have mentioned, um, well, let me, let me rephrase it. If someone was writing a biography about like Douglas Fairbanks and his, uh, films, if they might've brought something like the musical scores up into that, 
Well, I mean, I'm sure some we're not going to have yeah. an answer, but you know, absolutely, just, yeah. <laughs> I would yeah. think it's like someone might have a comment, be like, "And this music sucked." <laughs> they wouldn't say that, but you know. <laughs> well, what I'm saying is that, yeah, I mean, certainly the whether it's the autobiography or the biographers, uh, if they do some research and they talk about certain movies and they get into it, some of them might have details on whether or not there are original scores for silent mm. films, for sure. If if they uh, kind of lean towards that um i haven't read a lot of um i don't think i've read any biographies of the uh silent film stars that i'm aware of i only mm. so far i re I read that um as the parade goes by with kevin right. Brownlow. that's kind of mm -hmm. the 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 gateway drug <laughs> into <laughs> book reading drug. but yeah i i love that book um but yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the. But anyway, I just that's the only thing I want to comment is actually at least reacted to it. Um, the the whole uh, I I do want to kind of take us through a little bit of the the sequences. And so in the beginning of the movie, when after the uh, uh, the shepherdess, I guess the girl mm. falls does the, starts to performing miracles, and I guess uh, some years, ten years pass, right? And so mm. she's at some point she's kind of like Virgin Mary character incarnate, I guess, kind of a proxy <laughs> character. Representing and so it. she's kind of at this um, shrine, I guess. And uh, now there is a scene in the very beginning where uh, it's uh, a shot of the shrine itself of sort of the comings and goings of people going into the shrine, getting healed and talking about the coffers of the gold, right? Like the, the money's pouring in, right? From the miracles. <laughs> and <clears throat> uh, sometime after that, do you remember the shot that keeps pulling back and pulling back and pulling back from the shrine? He, in the that's beginning? when they were kind of building it up. Correct? When they were going in and out, the whole crowd was walking in and out. Yes. Right, but then the camera, what, what I'm saying is, so the camera first, uh, 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 you know, it's like, okay, so it's like 10 years has passed, right? So the girl's growing up. Yeah. And so we see the main character. She's inside the shrine, the, the main attraction, as it were. But then the camera pulls back out of the, the building. So we can see they built the whole building around the shrine. And then it pulls back some more. You can see the steps, right, where people go walking in and out of there. And then there's a gate into the steps where the victim of Black Doom, right? You know, the where he has to uh, beg for money, right? The, the Black Doom character in the beginning. Mm. It's sort of on the steps, near the steps. But yes. the camera keeps going. It doesn't stop. Like, it, you see hundreds, if not thousands of people, cast of these people going right. up into the, the shrine. But then it keeps pulling back, pulling back uh, into, like, basically the town. And so you could it, basically it's a very picturesque uh, set of like the town with huge buildings and it almost stretches on like forever into the, the shrine. Basically, like the whole town has been built around this sort of shrine thing in the and the way that the camera pulls back shows you just how large it is, how large has become the city of miracles and how many people are going there and how many people right. are going up the, the stair stairs. Right. In other words, and, it started with the shrine, and right. then a town built around it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know if it town was pre-existing, but it seemed to indicate to me, like uh, something was built around that. But the point, the point no, of the matter is that um, they do show it. They, they do. Okay. So sure. Either sure, way, because uh, they they show the scene where she falls off the cliff, right? And there's nothing there. There's no town there. So then they show the shrine. Right. And well, they we pull, don't pull really. Back and just, I don't think that shot it, shows you from the cliff to the background. That whether there was a town or not, but oh, either way, it doesn't okay. matter. The point I'm trying to make is that the tech, the filmmaking technique that uh, Fairbanks has <clears throat> uh, matured. I don't know if he would have made the same shot in uh, uh, the Mark of Zorro, for example. I mean, that was a more simple simple movie compared to this one. There are certainly sets and backgrounds in there, you know what I mean. But I, I don't think it dealt with this complexity, right? Where the cast of hundreds and they're going in and out of these buildings and it. And then the camera just can keep pulling back, pulling back, revealing more information. And by the way, I did like a lot of the visual effects that this movie had. I don't know if 
you guys are remember some of the scenes like when the mountain girl the, the, the town that she was in where they of course they dragged the house with horses <laughs> yeah that was funny degrees. i did like that I that was, was very funny but like those amusing. type of scenes when you see the uh backgrounds <laughs> it's like they have this uh miniature basically that they built uh this is the same type of miniature technique they did with the pull, pullback shot i just thought she described of a mountain and then you could see like a little tiny little black dot of a horse riding at least what your imagination is and all of a sudden to the left of the, of the house is the guy in the full size uh horse you know and the rider right do you remember the scene a little bit i don't know yeah, I wasn't even – that's what I kind of enjoy about these movies too is I'm, act, I'm actually not thinking that it's going to be a miniature. I was just – you know, I was just in the moment. I was like, oh my god, but what are they But that's what doing? I mean. The story is <laughs> – you're so captivated by the story you're not thinking yeah. about that. But I'm thinking about that more just for how mature that uh, Fairbanks is doing now for doing stuff like that, doing visual effects because it really is a part of like film history where from here on people are going to be doing these techniques for a long time, you know. Mm-hmm. but he's grown he's matured and he's doing a lot larger productions where there are a lot more special effects like this you know to fool you into thinking that they did you know i don't know if they did for sure i i don't know a lot of the backgrounds of production because the wikipedia didn't have a lot of background production about this so i don't know if they actually flew down there and shot some stuff i it, it looked to me like it was uh a lot of if not all of it was shot in uh, on a stage, you know, with visual effects. But, that makes sense. But anyway, so I was trying to just describe some of the um, unique feature of this movie. That it's not just the characters and story that was pretty amazing. I loved all the sets that they built, and also the, all the visual effects that they have been working on too. Um, I'm actually zipping through the movie now a little bit in pieces and like in one scene you not only see the town and the shrine and the steps but you also see the big rock uh, uh behind the town and then the mountains surrounding it and then the entire city a true city with lots and lots of houses and almost coliseum type uh, architecture around it so i thought that was interesting it just it communicates to you the grandeur of the city and how large mm-hmm. it is you know and therefore, how much gold would be. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I just want to point some of that stuff out. Um, so then he goes into this uh, mountainside place where we could see this beginning of this character, Mountain Girl, who's getting ready herself, right? She, I guess, crushes roses. I'm guessing it's roses. For makeup. For makeup. Yeah. What do you awesome. think of that? Because, cool Lily, you're, you know makeup. What do you think about that? Theme well, de- depicted on screen. <laughs> um, I, I don't, well, I don't know a lot about makeup because I suck at makeup. But <laughs> I, th- I mean, I'm thinking it, it just reminded me of what the Egyptians might have done because really, red lipstick is crushed up insects. Right. There's a fun fact for you. Like hundreds of like the like hundreds of Oops. red insects are put into like a, a mortar and pestle, and you beat them into a gross pulp and then you rub it on your mouth and it looks great. Sweet. Um, good stuff. I know. Yeah, good stuff. Keep that's doing what, that now, finger right? licking good. <laughs> I honestly, I think that it, I mean, they don't, the makeup companies won't tell you that I could be wrong. I um, could understand not telling the women that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I mean, really, I don't know how makeup is made, but I know it's how it was originally made. But the coal on her eyes, I mean, that was cool. The rose, I don't know if a rose petal would do much for maybe blush. Uh, That is an interesting, like, idea. If you beat it into a pulp and just smear it on your cheeks, maybe something could happen. Um, What else did she do? She put the flower in her hair. I think that was just it, right? She did her lips, her cheeks, and her eyes. So... I mean, back in the day when you don't have anything to work with, you just you got you go with what you have. <laughs> so that was I mean, I did like it because I was like, oh, OK, I can see that. You know, she she was beautiful. I mean, most of the women. I mean, well, yeah, actually, all of the women were pretty beautiful in this movie, too, even though there was only like three or four. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, I mean, she basically put it everywhere <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah so it's part of the makeup but the the meeting with 
uh, the gacha was pretty significant because, you know, she pushed everyone out of the way. She goes to meet her and, you know. That scene was very odd to me. Yeah? Because, yeah, well, obviously she was, she was very pushy. You know, she went to him and was like, I worship you, you know, and she put her put her head on his chest. And he was like, oh, okay, this is cool, you know. And then the yeah, other girl does a dance and he watches her and he's obviously entertained and she gets immediately jealous and starts complaining about it. And I was like, he would have just thrown her to the curb at that point. Like, you're going to tell me what to do? Get lost. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's Yeah. So I think that's part of the uh, characterization of this character at this moment. So he, you know that he's, yes, maybe cowboy and yes, bandit leader of this gang and people and stuff like that. But... Um, you know, you got this like women fighting over him, literally. <laughs> I know. Like this characterization of this, you know, potentially uh, kind of like a womanizer type, right? So he's not always a Dudley dude, right? In the beginning of this movie, right? Right mm-hmm. now, he's just he's, he's kind of just life. like he's just doing whatever, right? You know, whether it's this woman or that woman or whatever is, you know, it just goes with the flow and. He's uh he says new cities to conquer. So apparently he's kind of a bandit slash, you know, misfit characters going all over. But I will say the dance sequence is pretty pretty good for a silent movie, you know. For mm-hmm. you, I, so mm-hmm. thus far, I don't think we've seen a lot of dancing choreographed type situation, as far as I know, because there aren't really a lot of musicals in silent film era. But that was interesting. To me, and then of course, the uh, then we get into the scene with a Ruiz who doesn't appear at first because he sends his lackey. Um, I don't even know if there is, I guess, first lieutenant is played by Charles Stevens. Yeah, he, he sends the guy forward, and of course, you know, the gaucho will you know trick him and and take back the city basically, right. And we, because we could see this, he first lieutenant character is representative of the Ruiz governance. Uh, governance, of course, is corrupt, meaning you have to basically worship uh, Ruiz and not anything else, and you must basically respect this. And he's going to take all this money, right? And basically, he's uh, in, uh, the government is basically imposing taxes, if you think of it that way, because for every what ten people, you get two people. I don't know if you read, do you guys read the uh, signs that they're posting around town when the Ruiz's men? Yes, I did pause it at one point um, right. to see what they were sh- scheming, scheming. Right. I cannot pronounce this word tonight. <laughs> yeah, that's, that should be the way um, you pronounce it from here on. Scheming. Scheming. <laughs> but, uh, you should, you should make it sound like, uh, yeah, at one point like I did Sean pause Connery. it. Sean Sh- Sh- Sean Connery. Scheming. Sean Connery. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, what were we saying? <laughs> yeah, we're looking at the signs. I did pause it at one point. I mean, honestly, now I don't remember what they said. Right. Besides uh, the Ten Commandments one, because that's like, right. that's a give. Yeah. But, you know, you can't do this. You can do this. Give your money to us. We win. Right. The- but one of them was about, like, essentially it's taxes, right? It basically mm-hmm. was like, for every, you know, two or three or ten people, give us two. It just basically means, like, you know, whatever you're making now, we're taking over with the government and, and we're just going to take it because that's, that's what taxes are. And so yeah. that's a, it, that's why it's like representative of uh, the government. In the, no in taxation without is. representation. Yeah, and all that, all that, whatever that is. So anyways, at this point there, so they move the house, right? Which is ridiculous. And then... <laughs> This yeah. shows you some fantastic elements of this this movie. But this is still entertaining, even though it was mm-hmm. funny. Um, I don't know. What else can we say about this film besides go watch it? <laughs> well, I mean, he, of course, the uh, I love that he still does a lot of his classic stunts, right? So but when going he, up the mm. awnings was fantastic. Yeah. So he when he. Uh, See, of course, he single-handedly fools the whole city of miracles, occupy town with the 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 first lieutenant of Ruiz, and you know I knew that like he was gonna do his trick and you know get it done. Of course, he does, and uh, where he 
there was a scene in there towards the end of that sequence where you know you have to raise the flag right for his mm-hmm. um the bandits that could basically come in and occupy the, the town and before that you know he was holding the gun in the back of him to point at the the first lieutenant right <laughs> Mm-hmm. And he came out on a balcony saying, oh, okay, everybody, we're all done. We we, we captured the gaucho. Go home. Go take a rest, yep. you know? Like, yeah, I love yeah. that scene. He had two guns behind his back. Pointed, yeah, two. That's right. Pointed yeah. at two people. And so, I thought that scene was very clever. Very, very clever. I like that a lot. Because he looked like he had his hands tied behind his back. Exactly. It was very clever. Yeah, for the screen, it was just brilliantly done. Mm-hmm. So yeah. then all soldiers retire, and then he cleverly, he single-handedly kind of fools everyone into you know, allowing the city to be occupied uh, by the bandits. Now, what's interesting here is that we kind of get hints of his bandithood beforehand, but now we kind of get the full uh, uh, full effects of this character. So if you think about it, right, like from the City of Miracles town's perspective, uh, first they had no government, basically, and they are kind of free to do what they want. And so you had these padres and you had this... Uh, uh, sort of Virgin Mary, sort of prototypical character, helping the town out, healing the sick, getting the gold, but then the gold is given away to the poor. And so without interference, it appears to be kind of a good town, right? To, 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 to have healing and, and gold given now. It's, it, to me, it seems like some sort of commentary that like uh, Fairbanks was making where without these interferences, everything was fine. But as soon as you bring government, it's going to be corrupt, right? Automatically, <laughs> you may yeah. have some sort well, of well, yeah. It's once mean, everyone uh, heard that there was gold political there. sort of undertone of that, and saying. But then, of course, his own character when he comes to visit. Now we can actually see that instead of the corrupt Ruiz regime, it's his, He is the regime, though. Like He's instead of being freed, right after the uh, bandits came to town, the bandits wasn't like, okay, now you're free to do what you want. The bandits replaced the Ruiz regime, right? So mm-hmm. now they're the the government instead of Ruiz. Remember? Yeah. So that I thought I thought that was very interesting. Um except with with uh almost less rules and law and order cuz remember when he first came in that uh one of the Gaucho's um uh, uh first lieutenant character was like, you know, hitting the the Padre <laughs> and stuff like that. And of course, the gaucho was like, "Hey, you know, you 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 struck an old man. What's going on?" <laughs> mm. And he embarrasses him, right? Which, of course, later on in the story leads to his first lieutenant betraying him. You know, although we never get to see the payoff, I would have liked to see what the that character what happens to him at the end. We don't really. He kind of just uh, disappears at the end, you know, with uh, the mountain girl kind of beating him up. <laughs> you know what I mean? So. Anyways, well, you mean when he proposes to marry her? Oh no, no, no. So I'm I'm talking about that. So um, the gaucho has a first lieutenant, right? Right. The gaucho is sort of right hand man who beats up the padre, and then the gaucho right. beats him up and says, "You can't hit this gold guy." And then the padre right. goes, "Oh, I'll just forgive him." Right. And uh, the gaucho character is like, "What? Forgive him? That that makes no sense, or something like that." Right. Oh yeah, this is one of my favorite lines. You, so you can go. You don't know what to do. <laughs> Remember, so the Padre says, you know, he quotes scripture saying, you know, uh, forgive him. He knows not what he does, right? Right. Mm. Which is, you know, from you know Christ saying, forgive them, they don't know what to do. And so <laughs> the culture twist that says, go. You don't know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I love that. And that's the thing about this is pretty witty, especially his yep. mantra. His life mantra was like, uh, basically, eat, drink, and be merry, and let tomorrow worry itself, or something like that. You know what I mean? His mantra yeah. of like, uh, what does it say? Uh, today Today's is today. today, tomorrow's tomorrow, and then like tomorrow isn't yesterday. So let's deal with today. <laughs> something exactly. like that. <laughs> it's something like that. It basically <laughs> is. Uh, my distillation of that is like, eat, drink, and be merry. You know, for tomorrow we die, something like that. So, yeah. anyways, um, so I, I feel like once. Um, once the the um, the gaucho's character and his uh, sort of bandit comes into town, they basically occupy the town, replace the previous regime. You know, like basically, like 
you know, even though they're not as uh, strict and brutal or whatever, supposedly, but they're still just almost just as bad in some ways. Right. Yep. Mm. So. Well, you got to figure. I mean, because, you know, people who don't live by the law have a mentality of take what they want. Right. But they, they essentially become the law, though. Uh, that's what I'm saying is like, yeah. you know, instead of one uh, occupier, they trade it for another, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what he was trying to do is then he, of course, of course, he didn't he doesn't automatically free like all the prisoners or free everybody. He uses them for entertainment, right? Where he he and later on he has a feast, and he like gets the um, the padre to become a judge, right? And they're trying to judge the prisoners what they're doing, you know. And so you got like a group of poor people, and you know what do they do wrong? Oh, they're just poor and thrown into prison, you know. And so like he's using people for entertainment. He's still kind of a shady character, you know. He's not sort of his traditional adventurous Dudley do right character. You know what I mean? I think those scenes are where we get to see him the most the, uh, in, when he's in town, the, uh, the gacha character and how is he reacting to, to different situations? Right. Right. That's, that's where the writing is good. That's where right. it's showing him having a real character. Right. And then of course, this is the scene where he is meeting with sort of the, uh, so the Virgin Mary character, and all of a sudden, the victim of doom touches him, and he mm. gets like, you know, something where you, if you hold your finger over the flame, it doesn't feel it, which is like leprosy, yeah. right? Essentially, it's leprosy. Know, it's the same idea. Um, which now he's afflicted by it, and he goes through this very dramatic, uh, change of heart, right? Yeah, um, moments. So, anyway, that's pretty much the movie. Well, you know, at the end he 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 gets healed because he, uh, you know, believes in this uh, Virgin Mary character and uh, puts his hand in the fountain of healing and it gets healed. General Ruiz, we finally get introduced to, and they come to town, occupy the town, and says he wants to do it himself. They're just gonna hang uh, the gaucho, the padre. And uh, Virgin Mary. Oh, and they throw him in prison. And I love this bit where he's trying to use his uh, cowboy boot spurs to dig a hole out from the prison. But then he hits bedrock. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which is kind of his character hitting rock bottom, as it were. You know? mm -hmm. um, and after that, he basically hides into that hole that he dug, cover himself back up, and tricks the the uh the guards and the and the people into thinking he already escaped but they left the gate open right and so of course, that's how of he course. Escapes. <laughs> why close it he's not there i know for real <laughs> i love that and, and here's the more stunts right so after that and then you know the more of the um so then the mountain girl goes to get the rest of the bandits they come back and they oh so he's like swinging from tree to tree i gotta talk about this yeah, that was it's like cool. tarzan that was pretty cool. Yeah, that, that was I don't know how it's part. done. It's just like one like I I mean that I, oh, I I don't know if there's nets below or something where if he falls. <laughs> you know, how many takes did it do, right? I mean, he literally is swinging from tree to tree to tree, right? Mm. That's amazing, right? It was. It was pretty impressive. Yeah. So we don't have a ton of stunts like that in some movie, but when they happen, they're pretty spectacular you know? it was eye popping yeah eye popping exactly because that's what i did i went whoa <laughs> yeah. yeah it just seemed absurd a little it does bit. It, it seemed oh, unbelievable but i believe he could do it yeah i mean when you see the things he does um the way he jumps over things and vaults and stuff like when he went over the wall he was talking to the girl and with one arm, he, he grabbed the back of the wall and catapults his whole body over this wall that was like probably about six feet tall. Right. I thought, wow, that guy is in amazing shape. <laughs> right. 
of course, there's also there some of the techniques uh, is actually just fast forwarding and reverse. Uh, Remember what he did on the horse? Yeah, some of it is real for sure, uh, but I think there are certain scenes and visual effects and stunts that he's done where it's basically he's falling instead of climbing, so it it does look like he's, you know, defying gravity. <laughs> so there's a lot of sort of. Um, camera trickery to make it think like you can do some of the he can do some mm-hmm. of the things that he's he's he, he can do you know now i actually have a quick question because i'm looking at the wikipedia page and it's got this nice image of his costume what was the thing he was holding is it a whip it was like yeah a, it's like a indiana jones oh yeah. okay i couldn't i i don't know because it was kind of long rectangular yeah like a not a bolo but in the oh. t- title, like promo oh. image, it's he's okay. I, I, for some reason, I couldn't figure oh. out what it was in the film, I just thought it was kind of there. So, I'd have to go and look at the I'm gonna go to Wikipedia and look at it because <laughs> it made me curious now. Yeah, because not it, the bolos, yeah, I don't know, that's, that's the fancy necktie. I, yeah, I guess that's what it was. It was kind of like Indiana Jones's whip. I mean, he certainly, I think he has the whip, but he also has one of those uh, things with uh, that can wrap around characters and tie them down. I, I forgot what they're kind of like. Cat- yeah, I'm lo- maybe not cat- I'm that's the lo- bolos. The bol- yeah, bolos. That's what you yeah, That's what it is. Okay. It just, I think know, he's you- got a combination of things, depending on which scene uh, that you're talking about. You know what I mean? So, like, there, remember when he was uh, going to this, infiltrating the city by himself? Yeah. And he shot something to the uh, first lieutenant and tied him to the the wall post or building post. That's the bolos. Yeah, that's what he used. Yeah, so in that scene he used that. But then there are right. scenes where it's just a simple whip. I think. So it really depends on which scene. He, he's got it all though, because I think I I I gotta assume it's part of it. The characterization is that if you're kind of a cowboy type, and it, it actually plays into the movie too, where at the key point in the finale they herd the ca- the cattle or the cows into mm. overrunning the town uh to create a diversion so that they can go back into the town occupy the town right yeah you know what i mean mm-hmm. yeah on um on the wikipedia page on the poster that's on wikipedia the thing he's twirling above his head yeah those are bolos right okay which I, I, I don't know because I'm not a cowboy myself, but I gotta imagine it has to do with the profession somehow to capture the, the cattle or. Yeah, they were used for hunting, and what they do right. is they tangle up an animal's legs. Right. But I, I just love how some of that detail plays into both the character and characterization of, of you know, how he composes this character. You know what I mean? And he uses that in the movie too, both in the main plot points of the cow, but also through trapping like the first lieutenant against the uh, the building uh, pole mm-hmm. or post. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So things that were originally used for his uh, cowboy type professions now used for the plot of this film. The quote and for is for swinging uh, around the girl. Of course. When they danced. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it's. Uh, his his quote his mantra is yesterday was yesterday today is today there is no tomorrow make it today which is the final line right. where let's get married tomorrow and the girl says right. yesterday was yesterday today is today there is no tomorrow make it today yep <laughs> he uses his mantra against him <laughs> yeah I love that I love that ending yeah anyways anything else. You guys can, um, and of course that Vic, victim of doom. One last thing is that he he finally got full healing. It looks like at the end, right? He pulled off his mask and he was smiling. Yeah, it was really right, cute. Right. Really cute. <laughs> I want to say his smile was cute. He was like, "See, you can see me now. I'm done. <laughs> I'm all set. Yeah. You can look at me now." <laughs> mm, Without he was healed up. at the shrine. <laughs> right. Nope. No, I'm actually reading a little bit about Lupe Velez right now <laughs> on the Wikipedia page. I went 
all the way down to her suicide. I'm just like, oh, Looking for Liz. Yep. Sad. Yeah. So apparently, I I can't get information on the guy. So in her suicide note, she basically wrote that this Harold, some some Ramos guy, in, uh, impregnated her, and she's pregnant with his illegitimate illegitimate child maybe he's married I don't 20 know years that. old that's sad i wasn't quite sure what what the context was i don't know if that guy was married and uh made her pregnant and either way in she didn't believe in abortion and she'd rather kill herself and now she's yeah. gone through with it and so that's kind of the 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 context of that but it's it's wrapped up in silent film history uh uh, what's called like Hollywood Babylon lore. Hollywood Babylon is a book written by I forgot who now, but uh, which is kind of gossipy. It's not entirely hundred percent fact based. It's very sensational. So I think I I seem to think that her story is one of the many stories that they try to tell of how uh, like quote unquote morally screwed up Babylon is. That's mm-hmm. kind of the point of the book. Uh, it's why it's titled Holly Babylon. Is that people like this kill themselves because of the, uh, you know, a lot of very right. of information. But she she did die that way. So, sadly. Hmm. But anyways. Oh, she died at 36. Yeah. yeah. But she had a career in the talkies as well. Playing essentially the same type of character that she started with this you know so yeah well a lot of she cool. she made an impression on me in that movie that's for sure mm-hmm. yeah definitely has screen presence that's for sure yeah. and it explains a lot of her latter roles in the talkies and how popular yeah. she was stuff like that i'm looking yeah. at some of her 1930s 1940s movies and it's like it makes me like go and want to go and check them out yeah yeah, yeah. Well, now that you mentioned her personality, I mean, you can totally see that when she's <laughs> devouring the chicken leg and she's going hardcore eating it all. It was just so yep. funny and gross. Yeah. <laughs> she didn't care. She's acting. It was great. It was mm. great. Yeah. Spitfire character, you know? Mm. So. Anywho. Oh, she married Johnny Rice, Johnny Weissmeller. Yeah, I think so. I think is that's isn't that the one with the nineteen thirty three or something? No, that's somebody else. Never mind. Yeah, she married Johnny Weissmuller in thirty three. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Hmm. Curiouser and curiouser. Anyway, any other parting thoughts about the Gaucho? Go watch it. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. Yeah, we should try to link some of these movies in our show notes we'll definitely because they are available on YouTube. So, yeah, let's try to make a point doing that for this particular show note. Um, I will say that uh, I, 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 I probably forgotten more than I remember about his filmography, but watching this either again or maybe <laughs> I've watched it before. I can't remember. Uh, I seem to have seen this before many years ago, but um, I will say I keep revising sort of, you know, what I like from his filmography. But I got to say, this one is is his best work. I mean, of the things I've seen of his, you know, and I've seen like probably most of his stuff at this point. So it, I guess it's just a reminder to me, you know, how great of an artist he is still today. And, uh, and he's done so much over the years. And, uh, you know, from the mark of Zorro on, you got Robin Hood, right? The Three Musketeers, mm-hmm. Thief of Baghdad, the Zorro stuff. He's been, been done a bunch of sequels there too. The Black Pirate. And he's will go on to make other movies. But I got to say, the Gaucho is pretty good. Probably one of his best works. His magnum opus, the pinnacle of his career. <laughs> and his last silent film, huh? I believe so. I believe so. Wow. Oh, went out with a bang. There you go. Yep. All right. Any parting thoughts before we wrap up? 
I still need to watch the Mark of Zorro. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> you got time. You I time. know. I know. But still, <laughs> that's my parting thought. I still need to watch my... <laughs> um well okay so let's um let's wrap up here so um that's the end of our podcast here and uh you can wa- you can find more of our stuff at watching silent again that's watching silent films plural dot wordpress.com please re- um leave a, a star rating or maybe a review on apple Podcasts. it leads to other film lovers like yourself and listeners to Subscribe to us, listen to us, and um, find us ultimately on these platforms. Um, so wherever you get our podcast, please send some feedback on through the platform so that other people can find us. And if you um, have any thoughts, comments, ideas, questions, uh, please uh, don't be afraid to write us at watchingsilentfilms at gmail.com. And... Uh, that's it for this this week. So thank you very much, listeners. Thank you, Bob and Lily. This episode was produced by Lily, edited by Fong, and uh, we'll see y'all next time. <laughs>